session and I'm a member oh, recording in progress. Got it. Um, so again, my name is Mike Carlson. I'm a member of the Westland City Sustainability Advisory Board, the sponsor of this evening's event. Um, tonight is part of our ongoing education, or, or, excuse me, ongoing sustainability education series where we invite members of the community to learn from experts and each other on a range of sustainability related topics. Um, we've got new sessions scheduled on the second Tuesday of each month uh, at 7 p.m. So do look out for those sessions in the future. Um, check the library calendar, look for mention on Facebook. Uh, we will be announcing them as they come up. And uh, before we get started, if everybody could uh, do us a favor and just drop a quick little comment in the chat to let us know how you heard about this evening's event. Um, we'd like to reach as many people as we can with these events, and it would be really helpful to us moving forward um, to get a sense for what promotional avenues are most effective. Um, so if you could do that, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so tonight we have the pleasure of welcoming back Chris Lamar, uh, who is joining us again after presenting in November on the topic of composting. Uh, for those of you that didn't get a chance to see that session, uh, we'll drop a link in the chat that'll take you to the uh, city's website where we've got uh, a little blurb about that okay. presentation and a link to the video recording. Well, they'll say something, but I can't. And um, so let's see here. Here's my note. So Chris is a, uh, a certified master gardener and master recycler and has been so since 2013. And she is also currently the volunteer coordinator with the Master Gardener Speakers Guild series. Um, we're thrilled to have us with her tonight or have her with us here tonight to speak on the topic of fruit trees and sustainability. Um, if you've got any questions, drop them in the chat. I'll be monitoring that and uh, we can kind of pick those off and, and raise them at an appropriate time as the event goes on. And with that, I'll turn it over to Chris. Thank you, Chris. Okay, I'm gonna to go to my PowerPoint here and hopefully share it with you. Okay, I'm gonna cancel that try. And I've, oh, I always forget how to make sure that you all can see this. Can you see this now? No. No. Okay. Um, somebody needs to remind me to do that. Oh, this is Terrence. Can I please remind everybody to, to please mute your microphones? Thanks. Um, I have managed to lose all of you. I did this before. You'd think I'd. <laughs> I'm sure this again. Terrence, what did I do the last time that got you to see this? Share screen, is that it? Yes. Has Jerry oh, shared the screen for you? There you go. Okay. 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 All right, can you see that? Black screen. Sustainability in backyard yes. orchards. Yes. Can you see that? Yes. Yay! Great. Okay. Good. I'm sorry, can I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm sure. hearing a lot of background noise. I don't know where it's yeah. coming from, but I just, before you get started, maybe everybody could mute. Yes. I think it might be coming from the person who's ASUS21. Well, I see Marcy, Michael, and an iPhone, and Jody Hill are not muted. So if they could mute, that would be great. Well, I don't hear banging anymore in kitchens, so maybe it's that's possible for the host to mute people. Oh, well, I'm a co-host. I'm I'm not sure how to mute everyone, um, but I don't hear noise right now. I'll I'll Google while we move forward. Okay. Okay, so I know that you are a group uh, who are individually and as an organization interested in sustainability. And we all view sustainability in different ways and we apply it in a variety of, of environments. 
Um, I think probably in a community environment, we want the community to be sustainable, which means that the community will last as opposed to um, burning up or getting too warm or freezing or washing away. From an environmental perspective, sustainability also means that we not only help preserve our own uh, species, but also all of those species, animal, fungal, and plants that we share the earth with. And I have been involved with um, the extension program long enough to know that one of the more confusing landscapes for applying sustainability principles and just understanding what's going on is in that of backyard orchards. Now, I want you to know that I'm not using an, the term orchard to mean that you have to have acres and acres of fruit or nut trees or a combination of them. Um, you can have an orchard technically with just one plant. Now I'm gonna show you what that might look like. And the same sustainability ideas apply to that one fruit tree, that one uh, nut tree, for example, uh, as they would if you did have acres of, of uh, different types of fruits and nuts. So the goals of the presentation with, with the emphasis on sustainability are how to, to plan the orchard. And planning is really critical to any horticultural um, episode. Any, any time that you're trying to grow plants, you need to know what the essential elements of that environment will be. And that's particularly true if you're going to get bearing fruit and nut trees. And to that end, selecting the species and the variety is important because you may have an absolutely wonderful backyard, but it's not appropriate for certain species or varieties. I'm gonna explain why there might be limitations on those. And then finally, how to deal with problems. And from a, a scientific perspective, dealing with the problems is the one that seems to cause the most potential issues with remaining sustainable on our planet. So what's sustainable gardening in a home orchard? You'll see on the left an espaliered uh, apple tree. Espalier comes from the French word for shoulder. And an espaliered fruit tree is simply one that has been pruned so that the, the branches go out laterally. Um, they often, because they don't have a strong trunk, need to be anchored to some structure. As you can see, it's some kind of a cement or some other structure. And, and and it's easier to take care of a plant like this. So when you're selecting both the um, species and the, and the variety of the, the, whatever you're planning to put in your orchard, I suggest that you think about finding root stocks, that is the, 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 the root part of the plant to keep the trees small and easier to care for. Now, probably, the, the primary species that a lot of grafting goes on in is that of, of, of fruit and nut trees. And that simply means that you, you, you would not, but you should know what species and what variety of roots the nursery uh, and other people who, who do this kind of grafting, what they picked and they pick it because it is sustainable because it may ward off certain kinds of diseases or grow at a certain rate. And then they take scions, which are the top part, above ground parts of other trees. And this is when they're very small and they, um, they put them together in a way, just as if you were having a, a, a finger reattached, they want the arteries and veins to match up so that the water and the nutrients that come up from the soil through the roots will go up to the branches and out to the leaves and eventually develop fruit. And so when you examine a, a plant in a nursery, when you're thinking of buying it, it, it's helpful to look to see that you have a healthy graft area because if it's been done haphazardly, it's often um, open and can be a place that, that 
all kinds of pests can get in, uh, largely uh, the kind of pathogens, bacteria and, and fungi that will eventually kill the tree. So look for that graft and make sure that it's a secure one and that they don't try and sell it to you before it's been completely scarred over so that it's a secure uh, a graft. Now pruning is one of those mysteries when I'm talking to libraries and, and garden clubs, I say when, uh, as I get a lot of women in the 70s and 80s uh, age cohorts, I say, you know, in, in 1970, we had the book, Fear of Flying, uh, and now we have fear of pruning. And we are really very cautious, uh, novice uh, people who have any kind of plant, about pruning because we're afraid that if we prune too much, we'll kill the plant. But pruning, particularly in fruit and nut trees, really is important because it allows the open forms and the airflow. I think that's really well illustrated by the espalier. You can see that there aren't a lot of pockets where uh, uh, an, an infestation of insects or an infection of a bacteria or a virus can get in because the airflow is so good. And because you can see the leaves and you can see the fruit that's developing, you can see on this apple tree, you can monitor for pests a lot easier simply because you can see it. Now, it's also at a height that most of us could see. You don't have to stand on a ladder or scaffold in order to figure out whether you're having um, problems that you need to be able to identify and control. And then finally, and this is probably the most critical one, reducing chemicals reduces, uh, uh, prevents pollution. And because it's often difficult to control where you're applying chemicals, you have less overkill. That is, you're not killing species, plants, that you don't intend to have this chemical go to. And I'm going to get into chemicals and, and pesticides in just a minute. But a chemical, whether it's organic or produced by a large um, company, uh, is intended to have an effect. And if it's not limited to the pests that you're after, then you can do harm to um, unintended uh, victims of it. So when you're siting an orchard, and again, this is whether you have one espalier tree or five or 10 or 20 of them, and I hope you start off uh, small and learn what you're doing because you'll get frustrated. And um, based on my experience, you might have dead trees, which isn't very sustainable. First of all, and especially when these trees are, are young and they can't support themselves very well, in many cases because of that graft, the wound that I was talking about, they need to be sheltered from strong winds. Um, that doesn't mean that it needs to be an absolutely windless environment, um, but you will undoubtedly have seen, and maybe you did yourself, you took uh, some kind of wood and either uh, twine or a metal, hopefully encased in some kind of a plastic, to hold young trees up so that they developed, uh, so that they developed this ability to stay upright until their, their trunks are, are firm enough that they can hold the tree upright and be able to withstand uh, the, the wind effect on their upper branches and the leaves that catch the wind. Now, let me give you um, a sustainability tip right here. Never leave those supports, and this is true whether you're talking about fruit and nut trees or landscape woody plants, never leave those on for more than the first year because just as we learned to walk and our muscles became strong from that activity, um, it's true of all animals, but especially those of us with, with two legs who walk upright, uh, trees need to have that bending ability to strengthen the, the, the lignin, to strengthen the tissue that holds the plant upright in the, in the trunk. So take them off after the first year. They've got to survive on their own. I've seen schools and churches and a lot of 
places that probably don't have a lot of um, commercial uh, arborist involvement and they stay there for years and years and you're really not helping your, your tree by doing that. Secondly, it's gonna have to get eight to 10 hours of sunlight. Now that's uh, more extensive than what you're going to find for most plants and vegetables that are producing fruits. Um, they typically only need between three and six, maybe seven hours. And I'm talking uh, at the highest, um, you know, midsummer. Uh, ideally, you'll plant your, uh, your orchard on a slope. And rather than planting it at the bottom of the slope, plant it either on the slope or at the top of the slope, again, depending upon whether that's where the strong winds are. But you're going to get very well drained soil. And we're in the fungus capital of the, of the world. We have more fungi, many of which produce mushrooms. And the, the, but if you look out on an, an environment, most of the fungi that are there are in the soil. And there are some that are helpful, absolutely essential to uh, uh, plants being healthy, but there are other ones that uh, are pathogenic. They hurt what they're nearby. And fruit trees are especially uh, susceptible to many of these soil, fungi, primarily fungal pathogens. It's also helpful, and this again depends upon the um, species of plant that you're planting, that you have either southern facing sites, apricots, peaches, Japanese plums, and figs. And that's primarily because these are the plants that do the best in the warmer climates uh, as opposed to the next group, the northern or eastern facing sites, which are going to get not only, in most cases, less sun, but it's also going to be colder there. And these are the, they, this last group, apples, apples, pears, prunes, and berries, are the species that grow the best in the Willamette Valley and the ones that we probably have on the whole far fewer problems, both in terms of insects and infections, but also um, what are called abiotic, as environmental factors that cause them not to be able to, to produce what you planted them for in the first place. And this is really the um, epitome of, of shorthand in horticulture is the right plant in the wrong place is the wrong plant. So this requires that you know the area that you're planning to plant your, your fruit or nut trees in. Um, and to some extent, it relies on the concepts of permaculture. Where's the wind coming from? How much sun? If you want to delay planting a plant for a year just so that you get it sited correctly, that's probably a better investment of your money and your time and the assets that that, that tree is going to provide for you. Um, the soil and water requirements really vary a lot by the type of uh, the species of plant that you're planting. So for standard sized trees, you want them to be able to, their roots to permeate the soil four to nine feet deep. Um, that may seem like a lot, but if you have really good soil, and I, I know the word clay is going to come to your mind, but the, the roots of most of these plants are able to permeate quite deeply and in many cases, the roots themselves will help separate the soil particles. And it's best to have, especially with the standard sized trees, it's best to have um, uh, ones that will be able to permeate that over a period of time. So that's why you're going to have to watch them more closely to make sure that they don't tip over. And, and eventually, because they have such deep root systems, they're able to find water and, and they're far more secure if we have uh, storms that have a lot of um, either wind or rain. But for the newbie, um, if you're gonna start out, try it some of the dwarf rootstock trees. That is, they were the, the roots of the plant that they're using before they graft something on top are, are dwarf. And so they need far shallower uh, soil Three to, five, three to five feet deep. Berries and grape plants, and I realize that that's not the topic here, but they're going to give you some kind of fruits, obviously. They only need two and a half to three feet deep soil. And again, it's helpful if the soil that you have is closer to loam 
so that it has lots of air pockets and the water can permeate there. But, but many plants, unless they run into some kind of a rock wall laterally, will be able to permeate over time and be secure in the soil. If you're going to have raised beds, which are actually really good for the dwarf varieties, they only need to be two feet deep. And that's even, that's not much more than the, the best vegetable garden container would need. But for, um, if you're talking about plants that we think of as orchard plants, they have to be able to permeate that deep and be sure that you plant when you're siting your orchard, plant it near a water source. Because especially in the hot days that we're having in, in our summers now, you need to, if you're, I mean, if you're gonna go on vacation for two weeks or three, it's really helpful, especially when the plant is newly planted, that you have somebody who's gonna come in or that you have some kind of a watering system that's on a timer. Um, and that soil has to be well draining. But this is true for all of the species that I'm going to be referring to in just a second. You should stop watering in mid-September. Now, now, not only is that when historically our sources of natural precipitation start, but it's also because you don't want to encourage the plant to keep growing after the fruiting season is done. And you don't want the plant, and when I say growing, I mean you don't want more foliage to keep being added by the tree because when the cold weather comes, it's very susceptible to freezing and it will hurt the plant long term if you haven't helped it essentially go into um, its winter sleep. Now, here's one of the charts that I'm going to be referring back to. And you're going to, this is table number one in a a publication, Oregon State University. You don't have to memorize any of this. I'm going to provide for you at the end of these slides the, um, the publication number that you can go to to find this table as well as other ones. And if you look at the probably not only our our um, grocery stores uh, and farmers markets, but also if you were to do a survey of all of the, now this is not, doesn't apply to nuts because hazelnuts, this is a, a hazelnut capital of the world in the Willamette Valley, but apples are probably one of the most um, ubiquitous species. And so I'm gonna use apple trees uh, for, and the many varieties of apples uh, to just to talk through the factors that you need to think of in terms of sustainability. So apples are, are good in all four of the, of the um, areas throughout the state. And as I noted at the bottom, the Willamette Valley that we're talking about that concerns all of us is area number one. So apples are appropriate for the Willamette Valley. And depending upon the variety, they may only need five to 40 feet in, in terms of spacing them. And five feet isn't very far. And so it needs to be a variety whose both rootstock and scion tissue, both above and below the ground, will stay small. And um, apples across the board, regardless of the variety, have to have a pollinizer. And I'm gonna go into this, what I'm referring to in just a minute, but they need to have another tree close enough that the pollen can move from one tree to the other tree. So when you're thinking of apples, you need to think that you have to have two of them. So when you're talk, trying to figure out the spacing, you need to find space for two of them to be close enough that the pollen can travel from one to the other. We'll go into that in just a sec. But you need to be patient because it's going to be two to 10 years, again, depending upon the varieties and the health of the tree and the conditions that you've uh, utilized. Uh, in the early years since planting, two to 10 years before you're going to see any apples themselves. And then finally, in the last column, the sprays that are usually required to control pests and diseases. And you can see that um, the two insects, the codling moth, you've undoubtedly 
cut open an apple and found what you thought perhaps to be a worm inside. And then apple scab, and so hang on a minute, I'm gonna go into both of those. But you'll notice that in the footnote, it says the insect, that is the codling moth, if uncontrolled, causes wormy fruit or nuts. And many, many people who write into extension think that in fact they have some kind of worm in there. It's actually just the larval stage of a moth. And I'm going to show you how you can um, at least reduce the need to use sprays in ways uh, that will require your involvement with the tree and certainly you're paying attention to what you're seeing. Um, if you go through this, and again, if you might want to wait until I give you the reference and you can look at the entire article, but you'll find that all of these have some kind of uh, needs that require chemicals, um, except for uh, chestnuts and figs. And that, now these don't mean they don't have any problems, but it's just in terms of thinking ahead, do you really want to have a species of fruit or nut in your, in your orchard that needs to be sprayed. Um, so this is one of several tables in the publication I'm gonna reference later, um, but you might want to wait to choose what you wanna plant until you've had a chance to go through some of these tables because fruit and nut trees require work. So I did not know quite frankly until I was quite far into my master gardener service, the difference between a pollinator and a pollinizer. Uh, we all know pollinators because there's a lot of talk recently about uh, how pollinators are in decline, in many cases because of the chemicals that we use, but also because we're, we're reducing the habitat uh, and reducing the available flowers that produce the pollen and nectar that they need to grow. But a pollinator is anything that helps carry pollen from the male part of the flower, stamen, to the female part of the same or another flower, stigma. Um, many of the, so this is what we would call sexual uh, propagation. Uh, and some, some plants, some trees actually have both male and female flowers on them. So they don't need um, bees or hoverflies or butterflies, the whole variety, including ants and some kinds of beetles who move pollen and nectar from one plant to another or one part of the plant to another. And a pollinator is, is actually also uh, the wind or people who get pollen caught on a, a tree or animals who will track it from one place to another, uh, often inadvertently. But a pollinizer, on the other hand, is a plant that provides pollen. And, and here's how this all filters out in terms of, of apple trees particularly. A pollinizer is a, a variety of the same species of, in this case, apple trees. These are all apple tree varieties. And a pollinizer is a plant who, which produces pollen. So for example, the top two, the Iterid and the Manchurian crab are both early pollen producing varieties. That means that they are going to be able to have pollen available when other early, so there are only two of those, other early varieties will accept and be able to utilize that pollen. If, for example, though, if we just compare one extreme with the other, if you have an iterid variety, top left in your orchard, and you have bottom right, a Rome variety, the iterids pollen isn't going to be able to pollinate, pollinate the Rome because they're going to be like ships passing in the night. So it's important that you have two varieties, in this case of apples, in your orchard 
that one is producing pollen either early or mid or late in the season. And that's the same time that the other plant needs the pollen in order to create what will become a fruit. And if you haven't done some research ahead of time so that you have a, some overlap between the plant that has the female um, uh, parts and the plant that has the male part, parts, you're not gonna get fruit. Now, some varieties of plants, particularly apples, are what are called self-pollinating. So as I referenced earlier, they have both the male and the female parts on the same tree. They don't need anything but wind and maybe an occasional pollinator to move it from one plant to the other. And some plants even have um, flowers that have both of them on the same plant, so they don't need anybody helping them out at all. But if you have a plant that has one with just male flowers and another with just female flowers, you have to make sure that you have a different variety that the pollen is produced at the same, the pollen is produced by the male at the same time that the female plant is able to utilize that pollen. Okay, it's rather complicated, but people get very frustrated when they go years and years and years and never get a fruit and they think it's something that they're doing rather than something that's planted. And of course, one of the problems with the demise, the far fewer pollinators, that is insects primarily, is that the wind just doesn't do it often enough. And we have to have a lot of pollinators, bees primarily. And in some areas of the country, um, there are, are people who cultivate uh, bees and they take the hives around so that they can do that pollination. But you can make that a lot easier if you just have a plant nearby that will help with that work. Now, the, the first plant, the uh, apple that I showed you, the apple species, it had codling moths. And here's what a codling moth, what you would call a worm, but it's actually just a little eating machine that was in there. And the, if you, look down here on the right, you can see where on the left side of this apple, the, the female laid an egg. The egg, when it began to grow into a larva, crawled into the, the apple and started eating out the inside of the apple. At this stage, um, all they're doing is eating. And I'll give you a little secret, friends. Everything in the garden is, can be divided into two functions food and sex. So at this point, this little insect is only interested in sex. In a few months, it's going to pupate. If you remember how butterflies go into their cocoons, et cetera. Well, it's, it's then going to become an adult. It's gonna go back out. It's going to start flying around. At that point, it has quit eating and it's just interested in sex. So, that's, those are, that's the insect that apples are the most susceptible to that need to be sprayed. But the second one is called scab on the left. And this is a fungal infection that causes similar types of damage. But again, you need to be attentive to what they are and identify them so that you know what it is that you need to treat, if at all. Um, but, they, but when you're thinking about sustainability, one thing that you can do is do your research ahead of time and, and select varieties that don't have scab. They're resistant to scab, which means that you're cutting down on the amount of chemicals that you need to use. And here are the three varieties that are scab resistant. Again, we're in the Willamette Valley, so the three that you would pick. And they come to maturity at different times. And here are some of the comments about um, um, this type of uh, what you would be looking at in terms of um, whether you'd want to have it in your, in your orchard or not. So this is the kind of research that you need to do ahead of time so that you can one, cut down on chemicals. Number two, have fruit that you thought was worth the expense and, and the labor, and then ones that will be far less susceptible to um, 
in, in many cases dying because the infections become so great unless you've in, in, in gotten really involved in the spraying. But the concept of what's called integrated pest management or IPM is something that I suggest that you give some thought to. And integrated pest management, and a pest is anything that is in a place that humans don't want it. It might be a weed, it might be a disease, it might be an insect. Um, uh, but one of the things that you can think about is how do you use other mechanisms so that you don't have to resort to chemical controls. You use that as a last ditch effort to deal with whatever the problems are. And you may have a biological controls. These are actually um, the, the juvenile stage of lady beetles. Lady beetles are very good. They eat other pests in your garden. But at this stage, the, the larvae are little eating machines as well. So they're eating a pest that you would not want on your plant. Again, you're gonna to have to learn to identify which of these are good beneficial insects and at what stage of their life they are beneficial and which are not. Um, cultural controls, This is the you can see the picture of the apple which have dropped from the tree. One of the things that we, we know is that people who don't take care of in terms of cleaning up their uh, gardens, especially orchards, if they leave the fruit and leaves that have had any kind of, for example, scab infections, because scab uh, infects leaves as well as the, the fruit, they overwinter and you're gonna find them again next year. So cleaning up an orchard, getting these, what have become homes for insects and um, infections, pathogens, cleaning them out of your garden is a good way to cut down on whether they will be there the next year. Um, another uh, component of integrated pest management is using mechanical and physical controls. So for example, this is, an, I'm, I'm certain most of you don't want to go out and, and put these, um, these little snoods on all of your apples, but it does prevent the, the coddling moth, for example, from laying its eggs because you, you created a little envelope around it. And then finally, if you have to get there, you use can use chemical controls for this pest. Um, but hopefully that's a last ditch effort and hopefully you'll use the least, the one that's least um, probable to kill other things that, you, that aren't the targets and will also be less harmful in, in terms of the environment. So integrated, means using a variety of potential techniques, either together or sequentially. And a pest is a plant, insect, or pathogen, or microbe, which can be bacterial, um, fungal. There are about seven different definitions of microbes that we have, and each of them um, is in a different um, uh, kingdom. And, and they're fascinating to learn about, and we don't know all there is to know about them anyway. And then finally, management. How do you manage the, the problem that you have? And the question is, how do you find management tools? Um, and the comparison that I would say is, if you could use vinegar, why drop the atomic bomb? And vinegar has actually been uh, researched, and particularly vinegar that is in the 20% uh, concentration, what you have in your refrigerator is 5%. 20% vinegar can actually be sprayed on weeds that are, they're small. Once you get a, a, a mature um, a mature plant that has a very deep root system that doesn't work, but if you just have seedlings, just remember that when you're spraying vinegar, you're, you're hitting other plants and potentially microbes that are helpful in the garden as well. Um, so, Think about it, and here are some resources that you might want to utilize. Um, monitoring for the insects and diseases is important. Um, this is a just a trap that you put out in your orchard, and because it has not only sticky paper, but it also has a chemical, it's called a pheromone, P-H-E-R-E-M-O-N-E, -E -E, which means that it, it has a smell that we can't detect, but that insects are drawn to, 
and they will either get trapped by the, um, uh, the adhesive or in many cases, they'll, they'll just die there. They, they think that they've gone to heaven because that's attracted them and they think they're gonna be able to lay their eggs. Um, but they get trapped by the adhesive and then you can identify what it is that you've trapped here. And then because just knowing you know, the insect that you've trapped doesn't solve the, the scab problem, here is a, 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 an apple tree with a, no, it's just an apple tree, but there are a lot of, unfortunately, fruit trees that develop scab. But you can see from this that it's, it obviously has some kind of a fungal infection. And it's, this one's pretty advanced on this one leaf. It's important that you be able to identify what the problem is so that you don't apply the wrong thing and become unsustainable because you're, you're, you're wasting chemicals and potentially injuring the tree when all you wanted to do was to control this kind of a fungal infection. Now, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what a pesticide is, but it's any substance used to kill, repel, or control certain forms of plant or animal life that are considered to be pests. So an herbicide kills plants, insecticide kills insects, a miticide kills mites, fungicide kills fungi, bactericide kills bacteria, and homicide kills humans. Oh, I don't think we're covering that tonight. Well, anyway, <clears throat> there's also a lot of confusion about organic versus chemical controls. Or, and, and we use an organic boy in a lot of different ways. If you go into a grocery store and you go into the organic section, what you're probably assuming is that there are no um, manufactured chemicals that have been applied to during the growing process to that fruit or vegetable. Many people think that means you don't have to wash it off or worry about any hazards in your diet. That probably is inaccurate. Um, but uh, it is important that you understand that it does come from an organism. It's something in nature. Now, an organic herbicide can be just as deadly and toxic to whatever the target is, then a chemical that's manufactured by any of the major or minor chemical. So here's a label and the label is the law. It tells you what the product has. And although this, I didn't excerpt it, it also tells you how to use it. And if you use it in a, a method whether it's concentration or means of application, if you use it in a, a way that that is against the label, then technically that is illegal. So here is uh, the label from an organic pesticide and it kills listed plant pests, uh, primarily insects. Pyrethrins are derived from chrysanthemums. That's about as organic as you can get. Um, but it is just as lethal on those targeted insects as anything produced by Dow Chemical. And it can be used on the day of harvest. That's important because in many cases, and this is primarily more so with the chemical uh, pesticides than the organic ones, but there, there has to be a time period between when it's applied and then it may be a two day exclusion period or a five day or whatever um, before you can either harvest or consume whatever the fruit or vegetative part of the plant you were targeting. But you know, 100 listed plants, and those will be on the label someplace, um, is a fairly large number of pests that you might find whether it's on your orchard plants or whether in your vegetable garden. And so this is, the pyrethins are a botanical, so from botany, organic insecticide. Interestingly, they make up only 1.4% of the entire container. And this is typically by weight. Um, so what that's telling you is it doesn't take very much of them to be effective on the targeted, in this case, the pest is an insect. 
One of the more common organic uh, uh, pesticides is neem oil. Neem is a type of tree that grows primarily in India and some places in West Africa. And it is an oil. The reason that oil is important, and this is true um, for a lot of, of uh, insects, the reason that the oil part is important is because it's not only organic, but it smothers. Because if I were to put one of you in a vat of oil, whether it was hot or not, you'd suffocate. So neem oil operates because as an oil, and there are other organic oils that do this, horticultural oils. As you can see down here, it controls aphids, white flies, and spider mites. As you can imagine, they all, because they're, um, they're insects, they breathe, they're animals, but it also controls black spot, rust, and powdery mildew. All of those are fungal. Interestingly, we share 66% of our, of our genetic structure with fungi, funguses, and fungi also breathe in the sense that they need air to live. So when you coat either the, the insects that are the target pests here, or the fungus, those three that are listed and probably quite a few other ones, you're keeping them from breathing, you're smothering them. Now, once it either dries up or is washed off, it's no longer effective. Um, but as this says, a lot of neem oil is used uh, to kill funguses and insects and mites in gardens. So it's, it's safe in that regard, but used as, as directed, it's also very lethal toward those target pests. Now this is on the bottom right, the fictitious label, um, but the active ingredient, as you can see, is glyphosate, 41%. <clears throat> That's a fairly large percentage of the total makeup of this made up herbicide. <clears throat> glyphosate is the active ingredient in Roundup. <clears throat> so this tells you what you want to avoid contact with in terms of foliage, green stems, essentially every part of the plant um, of desirable plants and trees. Because essentially it is a generalist. Anything that it touches, it, it acts as an herbicide. Herbicide kills plants. So if you overspray or if you use it against the label in a, um, a way that the label, which is not pictured here, tells you how to use, for example, on a windy day, it drips over to a, a plant that you didn't want to kill, um, it will kill that. There are other types of herbicides that are specific. They either kill grasses, which are called monocots, or they kill all of the other type of plants that, um, that, that branch out, that have branches and leaves, for example. Um, but here are some actions that you can take for sustainability. And, and I hope you are able to think of ways that you could put these into good use. The first is to use manual, um, that is elbow grease, uh, or exclusionary methods for prevention and control. And the traps that you saw are a manual way of perhaps not controlling, but at least beginning to assess how you can control things like an apple maggot. Um, and the picture that I have at the top left is just the, you know, you let the elephant get his nose in the tent and then he wants to come in the entire way. So just like keeping weeds out of an area so that they don't um, compete with the plants that you're trying to grow, you, you make sure that you control the weeds in your orchard. They're competing for uh, certainly water and nutrients in the soil. And if you keep your orchard well weeded, keep out the the pests that are the plant type initially, you won't have to deal with applying other control methods later, such as chemicals that kill grasses. You want to avoid soil compaction. And soil compaction happens in a lot of ways that we don't even think of. Just walking on the soil in your orchard or any kind of a, a landscape environment pushes down, just the weight of your body pushes down. And in doing so, you're pushing out the air. Air is important in soil. It, it, Perfect soil has 25% air, 25% water, 
45% either clay, sand, or um, silt, or a combination of those, and only 5% organic things. And by compacting it, either by driving tractors on it or rototillers even, which really are not recommended, um, will cause and if you it will cause the air to come out, if you don't have those kind of air highways, you're not going to have good soil because the, the water won't be able to get down to the roots and the roots will die. Uh, it, this also happens a lot when people are building new houses and they bring in heavy equipment and they'll find that it's nearly impossible to grow any kind of plants, even, even lawns, because the, the roots simply can't get into that compacted soil. Um, also think about reducing or eliminating chemicals. And again, you can do that by using the elbow grease that came with your elbow and the various kinds of mechanical devices that will get out, well, I mean, the one, I think of the most is the dandelion whatever, trowel that goes down. They're hard to find anymore. Use as few supplemental materials as possible, which is to say, if you have a, a source of water nearby, use that rather than stringing um, some kind of water source 50 feet from your house or your barn or wherever. Um, being sustainable means that you work with nature rather than using all of the man-made chemicals and gadgets that we have um, created over the centuries. And then finally, don't harm non-targeted plants, animals, and microbes. And the picture that you see on the right-hand side is a microscopic view of, a, I can detect about five different kinds of microbes. There are bacteria, uh, this, the green, long green things are probably nematodes, which are microscopic worms, um, amoeba, um, bacteria, and, and, and lots of fungal hyphae, the little, they look like roots, but if you turn over a, you turn over a rotting um, uh, branch or, or trunk of a tree, you'll see all of these hyphae that are that go back to the place where the mushroom is formed. And they're absolutely essential. But if you walk on it, or if you apply sprays, even organic sprays, you're, you're running the risk that you're killing these, these fantastically important um, microbes. And just a handful of good soil contains a billion, that's with a B, bacteria in it. That's why it's so critical that we not apply any more chemicals as is absolutely required. Now, this is the publication that most of the information and the initial table that you saw is out of. Um, and hopefully you can come back and, but if you can't write it down, if you just go on the internet and look for OSU publication EC 819, I think it's, you can buy it, but you can download it, it's PDF. And it's um, a wonderful resource for what we've been talking about, just in terms of tree fruits and nuts. It does have some information um, on detection, and it also has uh, a, a good deal of information on the use of both physical and chemical um, control mechanisms. I want you to know about a class that's coming up. Um, it is, I think it is January 26th. I of course didn't copy that part of it down. It's over the noon hour and it's a Zoom class that you can go to. Um, uh, Sherry Sheng, who's a Clackamas County Master Gardener is going to give this class and she's um, a, quite a good Master Gardener and has worked in a lot of gardens. So if you want to uh, come back once this is over and get the Zoom registration, um, we'd love to have you, limited, unlimited people, to attend and listen to it. And then long term, here are some other assets that you might find helpful. The OMRI, Organic Material Research, Resource Institute, um, is a group that um, certifies whether materials, and not just pesticides, also fertilizers, et cetera, whether they are actually organic 
um, or not. And if a product has an OMRI certification, you know that it is in fact organic as opposed to being traced back to a chemical company and not being quote unquote natural in origin. The second is the NPIC, uh, National Pesticide Information Center, which is actually located in Corvallis. And this website has an incredible amount of information about the types of pesticides that are uh, available and authorized for an enormous range of, of pests um, with instructions on how to use them, cautions, and just as importantly, whether they are known carcinogens or some other hazard to um, human and other kind of animal life. And then the next one is uh, the Pacific Northwest Handbooks. This is a joint publication between the uh, University of Washington and Oregon State University. And it's a searchable guide so that if you, you have a species um, of a plant, you wanna know what, what the problem is. It has pictures and it has treatment mechanisms um, and it can be used uh, to identify and provide answers for, the, for weeds, um, pathogens such as bacteria and, and fungi, fungal infections, and insects. Um, it's not just the easiest uh, group of chapters to work with. You have to learn it, but it's, it's a way to start. And then the last one is the organi uh, organic pesticides and biopesticides. Biopesticides meaning coming from some kind of a biological source as opposed to a chemical source. Um, I, I showed you earlier the picture of the, of the nematodes. They're actually beneficial nematodes, which are able to go down into the soil and lay their eggs. And their eggs, as they hatch um, into larvae, actually kill the, the eggs of, of um, insects, what will become harmful insects in the future. Um, but it's interesting to know that there are a whole panoply of resources available to help you with your orchard problems and other parts of your garden as well. Even if I did it tomorrow, the world would go to pieces, I'd still plant my apple tree. Martin Luther. Um, I hope that you aren't intimidated by all the information and that you'll use these resources so that if you decide that you want to create an orchard, even if it's just one espaliered apple tree, that you're able to find some answers and encouragement and um, know enough about what your orchard is going to look like um, and how it functions so that you won't get discouraged and that you too will be glad that you planted your apple tree, even in the face of the future unknown. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Chris. That was a, a wonderful presentation. There's a lot to digest in there. I'm glad we have the uh, everything on recording and uh, we'll be posting this uh, to the city website within the next couple of days or so. Um, uh, with that being said, I did want to just ask everybody again, if you could please drop a little note in the chat to let us know how you heard about tonight's session. And uh, if there are any questions, I think uh, we are pretty low on time here. Um, but I did want to thank Chris again uh, for taking the time to speak with us this evening. It was uh, wonderful having you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. You're welcome.